everybody, welcome back to the shop. It's been a while since I've done a 3D printer review and the company Infomec reached out and asked if uh, I'd like to check out their new TX 3D printer. I decided to go ahead and give it another shot. This thing boasts some pretty impressive specs and what's most impressive is its price. If you're interested in check this out, stick around. <music> The thing that struck me the most as soon as this box arrived at my house was how similar the packaging looks to another fully enclosed 3D printer that everybody is familiar with. And that would be this, uh, this guy right here. So we're going to see if uh, the design of the Infomec TX is aspirational or if it is unique and hopefully innovative so let's find out right now the unit was fairly easy to unbox the printer was packed in a plastic bag and i pulled the whole unit out of the box by pulling up on the plastic bag this was a risky move considering the sharp edges of the printer and the general flimsiness of the bag but i was lucky and i got the printer out of the box and onto the table the printer came with the usual tools and accessories, a USB drive, hex wrenches, a clog clearing needle, side cutters, along with a sort of hat that goes over the top of the machine when printing temperature sensitive filaments such as ABS and nylon. This idea may be a little silly looking, but it is practical in terms of manufacturing cost and application. Having a removable soft cover minimizes cost, but still gives users the option of having a fully enclosed printing space if needed. Anyone who prints primarily in high temperature filaments will likely be looking for a printer built specifically for that purpose. The printer bears a striking resemblance to the Creality K1, and I'm guessing that is where it draws its inspiration from. If this printer performs as well as the Creality K1, it would be a steal at this price point. As with all of these pre-assembled printers, some finishing touches are required. I attached the spool holder to the back of the machine, connected the screen and attached it to its designated location, and installed the anodized aluminum handle to the glass door. Nice. Some of the features of this printer include a 220 by 220 by 250 millimeter printing volume, up to 500 millimeters per second printing speed, filament runout detection, easy access, magnetic hot end cover, and one of my favorite features, a replaceable volcano style nozzle that isn't proprietary and can be easily found anywhere 3D printer parts are sold. They also sell complete hot end assemblies for a reasonable price on their website. Turning on the machine for the first time, you are greeted with a screen to select your language. After that, it goes through a thorough self-test procedure, including a temperature self-test, vibration compensation, and self-leveling. The interface is intuitive and the touchscreen appears to be resistive, but is still responsive enough to navigate without having to press too hard. My printer found all available networks and connecting to my router was as easy as doing it on your phone or on your tablet. Time to load the sample filament provided with the printer. This is where I ran into my first issue with this printer. This isn't an issue with this printer alone. Many manufacturers tuck the spool holder and the filament feed location around the back of the printer. I have never understood the reasoning behind this. Most of us like to have our printers on a desk or on a shelf against a wall, but this makes feeding the filament into the machine difficult. This difficulty is compounded by the design of the filament runout sensor on this machine. You have a short piece of Bowden tube that goes into a pneumatic fitting. That fitting leads into the runout sensor and then from the sensor back into another pneumatic fitting, then to the reverse Bowden tube that feeds the extruder. The PTFE tube doesn't line up very well with the opening for the filament runout sensor. So you end up having to remove the feed tube, guide the filament into the runout sensor. I used an X-Acto knife to help wiggle the filament around inside the runout sensor to get it to line up with the switch and the output hole, remove the output tube to line it up with the filament, and then push the filament through to the extruder.
After I got the filament loaded, I checked the printer to see if it had any pre-sliced files on the SD card. I found one titled Benchy Fast, so I figured I would try it out to see how quickly this printer can crank out a Benchy. The results were not ideal. I figured this file would have been tuned to get maximum performance out of this machine. It did print the Benchy fast, but the quality of the print was lacking. I then decided to print the other Benchy file found on the SD card. This one was a bit slower, but still fast when compared to like an Ender 3 clone, and this resulted in a very well printed Benchy model. Now that the first prints were complete, and I'm convinced that this is a legitimate printer that appears to do what the manufacturer claims, it is time to download my slicer of choice and start with the torture testing. I picked Orca Slicer because it's very similar to Bamboo Studio, which I'm very familiar with. I was pleased to find the Infimec TX profile already available in the Orca Slicer software, with filament profiles for all the commonly used filaments available today. I downloaded a number of benchmark, testing, and torture files to put this printer through its paces. I sliced them and got to printing. Here are some of the tests that I printed out. 3D Tolerance Test by MakerNoob. Open Source Printer Evaluation by Autodesk. Engine Benchmark by Turbo Sunshine. Benchmark Bot by Kazi Toad. And the Torture Toaster by Clockspring. All of these models will be linked in the description below. The 3D Tolerance Test by MakerNoob printed flawlessly and every single knob was able to articulate freely all the way down to the minimum tolerance of 0.1 millimeter. I ended up dropping the open source printer evaluation by Autodesk on the floor, so it doesn't look as good as it did when I took it off the printer. All the intricate overhangs and bridges printed really well with just a tiny bit of sagging. The needle-like spires all printed great with only a tiny amount of fuzziness or stringing on the furthest left rear corner. I suspect the bridge sagging and the spire fuzziness can both be attributed to a small deficiency in cooling but the outcome of this test is still highly above average. The engine benchmark by Turbo Sunshine did have a failure somewhere in the print. At first glance, it looked like it printed correctly, but when I tried to turn the crankshaft, it was obvious that the connecting rods had printed incorrectly. Just to check, I ran the same test on my Bamboo Lab P1S, and as you can see, it printed flawlessly. Benchmark bot by Kazi Toad came off the build plate and already was articulating. I didn't need to break loose any joints or anything. The tolerances on these joints are super tight as well. Very good performance on this test. I ran out of test filament during the first few layers of the torture toaster by clock spring. I was disappointed to find out that the tail of the filament was wrapped around the spool in a way that caused a feeding issue and ultimately major under extrusion occurred. Since the spool hung on to the last bit of filament, the filament runout sensor wasn't able to pause the print before the under extrusion occurred. To test the filament runout sensor, I cut the tail of the filament free and let the sensor do its job. As designed, it paused the print as soon as it detected there was no more filament. I swapped out the spool and hit the resume button and the printer picked back up right where it left off. I still had to abort the print because of the aforementioned under extrusion, but I was happy to see the filament runout detection working well. I finished the torture toaster using some Merlot colored filament, and once again, as the print grew, some of the taller structures started to get knocked loose by the nozzle. I think this may be an issue with the printing temperature settings in the filament profile. If I print a little hotter, 
The nozzle may be able to lay down the filament smoother with a little less drag. That should allow it to print these tall, narrow structures without making them fail. After attempting to rescue this print with some foil tape, all the moving parts worked very well and the tolerances were correct. Now it is the time to put on the printer's little hat and do some high temperature printing. I'm not mad about the hat. You could attach it when you want to print high temperature filaments and you can fold it up and put it away when you don't need a heated bed chamber. When not in use, I have an unobstructed view of the printing area and when I do need it, I just unfold it and attach it to the top of the printer using the pre-installed Velcro attachment points. Full disclosure here, I have never printed ABS before. So this will be a good test of the filament profile for the Infimec TX. I sliced a standard Benchy using stock ABS filament settings and I sent it to the printer. The first two attempts failed almost immediately. It was almost as if the nozzle was peeling up the layers as it was passing over them. I checked the settings against known good settings in a different slicer, and I noticed that the print temperature of the Infimec profile was way too low for ABS. As soon as I raised the nozzle temperature, the Benchy printed with just a tiny bit of warpage. I'm sure I can correct for that with future tweaks of the profile and maybe printing with a brim. Overall, my impression of the Infimec TX is that it's an impressive little printer. It comes out of the box pre-assembled. It has a solid profile available in any slicer of your choice. It is capable of printing high temperature filaments and the consumables are cheap and easy to find. And that's not even mentioning the printing speed. I know this printer is meant to compete with the Creality K2, but it even the performance of this printer even gets close to my Bamboo P1S. However, if you push it too far, its limitations become very obvious very quickly. This printer occupies an interesting space in the 3D printing world. It is fast and easy to use like a Creality K2 or a Bamboo P1 series, but it has a smaller build value. Infimec is currently selling it at an introductory price of $300. This printer is a no-brainer at that price. However, the word introductory means that they plan on raising the price somewhere down the road. I really don't think Infimec will have much room to increase the price because as you approach that $400 price point, they will be competing with bigger, faster, and more capable machines. My hope is that they stay close to this current price point. They could dominate this corner of the 3D printing market if they stay as close to $300 as possible. The performance of this machine is solid, and it is a good way to get into high speed, high temperature printing at an affordable price. I highly recommend this printer if you are looking for these features. And if you're interested in picking up one for yourself, I will leave a link down in the description below that you can click on to find out more. Now before I wrap up this review, I think I'm going to fix a couple of the things that bother me about this printer.